welcome to the ITN European Video Atlas on CD-ROM. Europe in the 1990s is exciting because it is in the process of change. With the demise of communism, ideological arguments have given way to numerous ethnic and territorial conflicts, giving an entirely new meaning to the concept of continental drift. At the same time as refugees stream across the continent, the pressure intensifies for European nations to cooperate and to create a single market, the biggest in the world. This interactive atlas with its ITN video reports and extensive reference database, including maps, photographs, facts and figures, is designed to help you explore and understand the new Europe and its people. During the 1990s, this new Europe could become the economic and trading center of the world, and it's our intention to update the content of this atlas on a regular basis. Europe has arrived, and it's here at your fingertips. From this home screen, you can explore the comprehensive content of this atlas. Just click on any of the small screens to start your exploration and see at a glance, country by country, pictures and video profiles, as well as information and statistics on political, economic and social aspects of all the European countries. You can also dynamically display the statistics in graphs and charts. Try your hand at economic forecasting. Remember, you can call on the help screen at any time and you can always return to the home screen by clicking on the ITN logo in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. From the databank screen, you can access a wide range of information, historical, political, social, economic, environmental and geographic for each country. There are options to view the statistics as graphs or tables and compare data for different countries an electronic navigator for Europe. Using the map screen, you can zoom and pan around the countries and select and display a range of physical features such as contours, roads and rivers. This screen allows you to view a video profile of the social, economic and political life of the country. These profiles have been specially edited from ITN news footage. The image bank screen will allow you to display a special selection of pictures depicting different aspects of the life in each of the European countries. You can view the images automatically or step through them under your control. From the Gazetteer, you can select any of the places in the full European map and go straight there. A map will be displayed with your selection centered.
Albania remained the last outpost of Stalinism in a fast-changing Europe. The dictatorial communist leader Enver Hodja did nothing to hide his devotion to Stalin. And he made sure his people shared it right up to his death. In 1990, Albania finally opened up to Western-style democracy, and only then were Albanians allowed to practice religion and travel abroad. Until that time, defectors had faced the death penalty. Albania may have ended 45 years of almost total isolation, but it could not so quickly eradicate the poverty that burdens all of this country. It's the poorest land in Europe. Since the collective farms were privatised, most agricultural workers received no pay at all. A month's unemployment benefit wouldn't buy one loaf of bread. The cost of potatoes went up 900% after westernisation. It's a nation almost completely dependent on outside aid. In the rundown hospital, surgeons operate with no gloves and often no anaesthetic or painkillers of any kind. The mighty Enver Hodja and his system may have fallen, but ordinary Albanians are caught between two worlds and they're still suffering for it. Wedged between Spain and France in the eastern Pyrenees, Andorra is a principality largely dedicated to fun. It has turned its mountain terrain into what is effectively a national ski resort. Tourism is by far the dominant concern. The population is that of a small town, just over 50,000, and the official language is the ancient Catalan. For much of this century, Austria has lived in the shadow of its powerful neighbour Germany. Now it also shares one of Germany's main problems, protecting its borders to keep down the flood of refugees from the former Eastern Bloc. Austria's rich history right at the centre of Europe is still alive throughout the capital and in Mozart's city of Salzburg. Part of the Hofburg Palace in Vienna, home to the Habsburg emperors, was recently destroyed by fire. During the 1980s, the country's more recent history came under the microscope Former President Kurt Waldheim was accused and then feared of being involved in atrocities during the Second World War. But now the outlook is to the 21st century. Austria has membership of the European Community and its seven and a half million people are looking to build their future and prosperity in the new economy of the United States of Europe. At a hospital in Biela, Russia, Nina Turovchik weeps for her five-year-old daughter, Irina. <laughs> she is a victim of leukemia. Anton Shlechkov has leukemia too. He is six years old. His doctors say he has no chance of recovery. They are not alone here in the Gomel Regional Hospital, 80 miles north of Chernobyl. Volodya Semerovich, eight years. Lina Sergeyenko, not yet two. Roman Dildin, eight months, all have leukemia. Stricken children, angry mothers. It is an anger born of frustration, for officially the cause of the leukemia is unknown. But while experts talk of lack of data and absence of proof, the mothers have no doubt where the blame lies. Chernobyl's number four reactor is now swathed in a concrete shell, an ominous monument to the world's worst nuclear accident. Four years on, the long-term consequences are beginning to emerge. A mile from the reactor, the town of Pripyat remains as it was when it was evacuated 12 hours after the explosion. The dust which has gathered in its deserted buildings is still alarmingly radioactive. This is the abandoned kindergarten. The children who were playing here when they were told to flee have been dispersed to new homes and troubled futures. The radiation they were exposed to is only now starting to take its toll. Natalia Martinenko lived in Pripyat. 
She takes her three children to the Kiev Radiology Institute for regular checkups, and she's increasingly worried. Last winter, Tanya, who's seven, Roman, six, and two-year-old Irina, born after the accident, all fell ill. Aching joints, stomach pains, loss of appetite. It is not only those who lived in the shadow of the reactor who have been affected. This is the village of Strelachevo, 25 miles away. Twelve days after the accident, it was evacuated. Three months later, everyone was allowed back. Today, local doctors say only one child in 25 is completely healthy. There are kidney complaints, respiratory ailments, throat and eye infections, and birth defects. A baby born with six toes, another with his heart on the wrong side. Now, finally, Strelichevo is to be evacuated again. All families with children under 14 will leave. The Belgian capital, Brussels, is home of the European Commission, and Belgium was a founder member of the common market. Since 1945, the country has been a major force in forging a more united Europe. More recently, though, it's had trouble with disunity of its own. Political unrest between Walloons and Flemings became such an issue that Belgium effectively turned itself into a federal state with much greater regional autonomy. The conflict is even summed up in this reenactment of the Battle of Waterloo, Wellington's greatest military victory. Britain's modern Duke of Wellington owns much of the land here, but a vocal pressure group of Walloons wants it back. And modern day battles over perceived threats to Belgium's high standard of living. Brussels has seen riots by farmers of several European nations who believe new international trade conventions would harm their livelihood. But in a country with its own minister for the middle classes, trouble that gets in the way of trade never lasts for very long. Bosnia's Serbs, a community at prayer, but also a community at war with Muslims who until last year were neighbors. And because of the war, there is greater attendance at services for the dead than for the living. In the frontline town of Rogatica, there have been too many killings for any sense of reconciliation to survive. It is a town laid waste, and a year after the bitterest battles, nothing has yet been rebuilt. The once majority Muslim population was driven out. The Serbs who expelled them now little more than refugees in their own homes, suffering equally with those displaced by the fighting and who receive a meager humanitarian handout. One box of food per family per month. Yet only a few miles from Rogatica and behind Serb lines are Muslim villages, untouched and almost completely unaffected by the fighting which has raged around them. These Muslims continue to live as they have lived for decades. There is a reminder of the war in letters brought by the Red Cross from relatives across the lines. News of a daughter in Sarajevo, a brother-in-law in Tuzla. For these Muslims, their future may have to be under Serb rule. They pray it will be a future in peace. Until the collapse of communism in the Soviet bloc, Bulgaria was known as the 16th Republic of the USSR. So slavishly did it follow the Soviet system. Now in the capital, Sofia, the people listen to the Voice of America radio station showing how much Bulgaria has turned its face to the West. But the change has brought hardship and uncertainty. Sofia may be a showcase for free enterprise, but the shops are full of goods well out of the reach of ordinary Bulgarians. The West is also unhappy about allegations that Bulgaria broke the United Nations sanctions against the former Yugoslavia, supposedly running fuel and guns to Serbia. Now the communists are gone, religion is practiced openly again in churches like the famous Rila Monastery. But economic rebirth is proving more elusive. Any instability in a country so close to the former Yugoslavia could be an explosive problem for the West.
Cyprus remains an island divided, despite attempts by the United Nations to bring the Turkish and Greek Cypriot communities together again under one government. The Green Line still separates Turkish Cyprus in the north from Greek Cyprus in the south. The Greek Cypriot government, based in Nicosia, is recognized by the West. The self-proclaimed government of northern Cyprus is recognized only by Turkey. Business leaders believe that unification now makes economic sense. The Greek Cypriot economy is thriving. Agriculture, textile manufacture, offshore investment and tourism all doing well. There's a shortage of workers in the south, but high unemployment in the north. Cyprus also retains an important role as a listening post for British and NATO forces eavesdropping in the Middle East. So the Western world has a vital stake in the island's future. Twice within 30 years, the former Republic of Czechoslovakia was invaded by hostile foreign troops. The Soviets to put down the Prague Spring of 1968 and, of course, the Germans 30 years earlier. When the Soviets withdrew, the Czechoslovaks believed their dreams of freedom had come at last. But there was to be no Prague summer for the newly independent nation. Friction between the Czechs and the Slovaks reached such a height that the country eventually split into two. Against the wishes of many Czechs, 1993 saw the creation of the Czech Republic, its capital still Prague, and also an independent Slovakia, with its parliament in Bratislava. Slovak leaders hailed it as the fulfillment of a long dream for a separate nation. Economically, the so-called velvet divorce quickly turned to bitterness. The more traditional Slovak industry is finding the going tough on its own. Nowhere have the passions aroused by European integration been more keenly fought out than in Denmark. There were riots on the streets of Copenhagen when the country voted in a second referendum to accept the Maastricht Treaty. An earlier referendum had voted against it. For 20 years since joining the common market in 1973, Denmark had rather cynically enjoyed the best of both worlds, partaking of the economic benefits of EC membership with little interest in political integration. For that matter, political integration has never been easy to achieve at home either. Power to the people! For the past 20 years or so, Danish voters have been saying yes to a succession of minority governments, creating zigzag economic policies. The Danes enjoy a high standard of living, but pay very high taxes. Indeed, MPs were called back from their summer holidays in 1988 because of a taxpayer's revolt. Behind the placid exterior are people determined to make their voice heard at home and throughout Europe. The former Soviet leader, Mikhail Gorbachev, remains a hero of modern Finland and at the same time the author of many of its economic troubles. In the last year of the Soviet Union, Mr. Gorbachev removed the ties that had made Finland a semi-colony of the USSR. The Finns reveled in their freedom. The economy protested loudly. With unemployment around 18%, industrial production down and the deficit spiralling up, Finland faced its worst economic crisis of modern times. Foreign exports plunged 25% and black markets flourished. The message was that living standards had to fall and the cost of the country's sophisticated welfare state had to decline. In the home of Santa Claus there were to be no economic miracles but a long campaign of cold economic realities. But the five million Finns, like their neighbouring Swedes, are looking to EC membership to expand their future. The country, like its outdoor loving people, is basically in good shape for the future. Any list of French exports will give some clues to why so many people of so many nations love the country so much. The market is bustling with connoisseurs. France is rightly renowned the world over not only for its wine and food, but also for most of the good things that make life that little bit more pleasant and even luxurious. 
Everyone has the space to enjoy the good life. The country is more than twice as large as Great Britain with a similar population. But there are growing tensions and they're becoming increasingly evident. Parts of the south of France are forecast to become a new Silicon Valley rather like California. This, along with cities like Paris and Lyon, is the technologically modern face of France. But there's also a France that lives almost in another century, with small agricultural holdings, small shops and much more traditional methods. The country's farmers take unkindly to the competition opened up by the single European market and by attempts to reform the world trade system. They're fighting to keep the pastoral France the tourists love so much. The technocrats in Paris have other ideas. The collapse of the Berlin Wall was a potent symbol of the new Europe that followed the disintegration of the Soviet bloc. It also defined for good and ill the new Germany. Berlin was a capital again, although the parliament remained in Bonn for now. It quickly became clear that the cost of reunification was huge. Hordes of refugees poured into the country in search of the material wealth they could only dream of on the other side of the wall. After the euphoria died away, Bonn began to count the cost of revitalizing the relatively moribund economy of the former East Germany. At the same time, this most powerful of European economies fell victim to the global recession. Industrial output plummeted. Even Mercedes stockpiling unsold cars unemployment headed for a post-war high. Social unrest too. The country's five million immigrant workers became the focus of racist attack. The right wing grew in strength. This then the challenge of the new Germany to meet the costs of reunification and restore the economy while at the same time surviving the social and political upheaval brought on by these huge changes. The Acropolis of ancient Greece looks down on an Athens choked by pollution. Indeed, the whole country faces the task of transforming itself into a modern European state, committed to meeting the strict economic demands of the Maastricht Treaty. Parliament is pledged to bring inflation into single figures and to trim back the deficit in the national bank account. Hundreds of thousands of visitors every year keep the tourist industry strong. And the increasingly modern and business-like ferry fleet is revitalizing the island economies. Shipping is still a major industry for Greece. It's been said that as well as democracy, the Greeks invented the north-south divide. Common market membership has lifted prosperity in the rural north and the region is taking an increasingly sophisticated approach to business. One dark cloud involves tensions between Macedonia in Greece and the Republic of Macedonia across the border in the former Yugoslavia. It could be a region of increasing and future trouble. The last Soviet troops finally packed up and left Hungary in June 1991, 35 years after the revolution in which Hungarians tried and failed to free themselves from Stalinist control. After all the waiting, the country was impatient to embrace Western-style democracy and economy. Less than a year later, the first Opel Astra car rolled off the production line at General Motors' new plant in Hungary. Political leaders of the day said the car symbolized the country's economic rebirth. But the enthusiasm couldn't hide the difficult economic road ahead. One example of the difficulties was the threat hanging over the famous Tokai vineyards. With the end of communism in the Soviet Union, their most important market had virtually disappeared. Even in such a successful enterprise, privatization proved difficult because of the scarcity of venture capital. Most of the population suffered stagnating or declining living standards. Political leaders had promised 10 years of pain to get the economy back on course. For ordinary Hungarians, that pain began to bite all too quickly.
a bunch of bananas homegrown in Iceland, just south of the Arctic Circle. Despite its name, the wild landscape of Iceland is also home to the volcano and a vast network of hot geothermal springs. Science has turned them to ingenious use. The hot water from the springs supplies heating for all of the island's quarter of a million people. And for those interested in alternative medicine, these hot springs are said to be very good for the health. Hydroelectric power comes from the torrents of glacier rivers. Indeed, so much of it that Iceland is looking at ways of exporting it to other energy-hungry Western nations. Iceland became independent from Denmark in 1944. Fish and fishing technology are still major exports. In 1976, the country had a commercial war with Britain over fishing rights. But the traditional economy is already making way for research and the development of new fields of science and industry to see Iceland into the 21st century. Some prospectors want to mine for gold in these mountains of County Mayo, but the outlook is nothing like so bright for most Irish people and their economy. Unemployment is more than twice the European community average. Recent years have seen rising interest rates and continual efforts to save the Irish punt from devaluation. Ireland depends heavily on the European community, but must trim its finances and improve efficiency to be part of it. No less important to Irish life are the social issues dominating the country. The President, Mary Robinson, was elected on a programme of social reform as well as job creation, but a constitutional ban remains on divorce and abortion. And the troubles in Northern Ireland still have the potential to strain relations between the Republic of Ireland and the United Kingdom. Unionist leaders are unhappy about Dublin's role in Anglo-Irish talks over the future of Northern Ireland. Rome has probably seen it all before, but that's not much consolation to Italians today. Despite the outward appearance of Dolce Vita, post-war Italy has been dominated by instability and corruption. Since the monarchy was replaced by the First Republic in 1946, there have been more than 50 governments. At least four former prime ministers have been accused of links with the Mafia, and a host of anti-Mafia judges have been murdered. The 1980s were relatively good years for Italy's economy. Confidence was high and industry surged ahead. But with the early 90s, unemployment returned, and the north-south divide grew ever wider. Industrial profits fell sharply. Now Italy has promised more stable budgets to meet the conditions of the Maastricht Treaty by the turn of the century. But the financial markets remain sceptical that Italy can keep its budget deficit under control. Luxembourg is the smallest member of the European community, but one of its most prosperous. The country is a haven of calm and social integration, even though half of its workers and nearly a third of its residents are foreigners. Unemployment is negligible, and the people of Luxembourg enjoy one of the highest standards of living in Europe. The one dark cloud on its horizon is the country's reputation as an international oasis for money launderers and tax dodgers. The country has now changed its laws to ban drug-related money, but bank secrecy laws still protect all other funds. Small does indeed seem to be beautiful for Luxembourg, a people flexible enough to take quick advantage of every change in community laws. May 1992, and the British Queen sails into Malta for an anniversary that sums up much of the personality of this Mediterranean island with long links to the United Kingdom. It was exactly 50 years since the island and all its people were awarded the George Cross for their courage and heroism during the Second World War. 
Since independence, Malta has held fast to the British connection. The vital tourist industry still attracts large numbers from the United Kingdom. English is one of two official languages. But Malta must now look to the rest of Europe. The Union Jack is now the flag of the older generation. Apart from special occasions like royal visits, the island's children, in fact, live in a culture dominated by Italian television, and their eyes are already turned to mainland Europe. Queen Beatrix of the Netherlands visits the site of an air disaster at Amsterdam in 1992. An Israeli plane had scythed through two blocks of flats housing many poor immigrant workers. The Queen had summed up the personal loss felt by a small nation. The Netherlands has a population of less than 15 million, but it is one of the most prosperous countries in the Western world. At the same time, it has been at the forefront of social and environmental protest and change. The Dutch were among the most vocal in Europe in their opposition to American cruise missile bases. Pollution has been one of the main issues in political debate. Environmental concerns are always prominent in election campaigns. And Amsterdam is internationally known for its liberal attitude towards prostitution and the treatment of drug addicts and AIDS victims. The Netherlands is one of the most pro-European countries in the EC, but ordinary people are worried that they'll be dwarfed by the wishes of the big three, Germany, France and Great Britain. Norway's decision to resume the hunting and killing of minke whales in defiance of an international ban on whaling clearly defines the political and economic dilemma faced by the government in Oslo. After 30 years of changing their minds, Norwegians applied again to join the European community. The whaling decision presented a problem. It's not just whaling. The independent-minded Norwegians have made it clear they want to keep substantial rights to North Sea oil and gas and their rich fishing grounds. The 4.2 million Norwegians have a high standard of living, but the cost of living is also high, and that's one reason why thousands of them cross the North Sea every Christmas to shop at the much cheaper department stores in England. The country is still a member of NATO and an important training ground for its troops. But although Norwegians already play a central role in European life, they remain sceptical about giving up too much of their autonomy to Brussels. The Lenin shipyards in Gdansk and Poland's Solidarity Trade Union opens up some of the first fault lines in the old Soviet bloc. Solidarity's campaign for Western-style political freedom brought martial law and an attempt to stifle the protests. But protest leader Lech Wałęsa won the day. He also won the Heart of the West and the Nobel Peace Prize. Now, President Wałęsa is at the receiving end of Solidarity protests. Modern Poland has been paying the price of freedom. Even though industrial output fell, factory workers as well as professionals went on strike demanding pay increases. The economy remained in a straitjacket. Successive governments imposed tight budget restrictions to meet the conditions for financial aid from the International Monetary Fund. Nevertheless, the experts say the country's new economy is not only basically healthy, but growing. Despite the problems, Poland's international creditworthiness is strong, the country is also foremost among Eastern European nations seeking early membership of the European community. May 1992 and a fleet of sailing ships leaves Portugal for America. They're celebrating the 500th anniversary of Christopher Columbus's epic voyage of discovery across the Atlantic. Memories of a greater time 
when Portugal, along with Spain, controlled much of the Christian world and produced men like Henry the Navigator and Vasco da Gama. Today, Portugal is one of the poorer nations of the European community, but growing fast, and the country's leaders have scheduled a program of economic and social reforms to increase the pace of growth. But poverty is still very much in evidence in the cities. Per capita income is just over half of the EC average. For the home of Port, the story of the 90s is one of hopeful austerity. The country is committed now to cutting inflation and the budget deficit to comply with the Maastricht conditions for economic union of Europe. Ever since Romania's Christmas Revolution of 1989, one image of the country has haunted the West above all others, the orphans. Up to 100,000 of them, many suffering from AIDS, were discovered living in squalid Dickensian conditions in state homes. The fallen communist leader, Nicolae Ceausescu, had banned contraception and abortion. As the country fell into increasing poverty, his policies forced families to abandon their children. After the revolution, Ceausescu was executed. In the capital, Bucharest, the gloom of the bad old days has lifted, at least on the surface. Many of the shops are now full of Western fashion and consumer goods, but there's often a shortage of food. The economy still lags far behind most of Romania's European partners. Mikhail Sergeyevich Gorbachev, one man who perhaps more than any other individual helped change the history of the late 20th century. His dialogue with Western leaders, especially America, spelt the beginning of the end for the Cold War. Treaties on nuclear arms reductions paved the way for huge cuts in defence spending and helped him tackle the economic problems at home. But despite Gorbachev's enormous popularity, he couldn't control the changes he set in train. In 1991, a hardline communist coup against him brought the people and the army face to face on the streets of Moscow. The hardliners lost in the end, but Gorbachev was also swept from power to be succeeded by his former deputy, Boris Yeltsin. After nearly 75 years, the empire of the USSR split into 15 separate states, all pursuing a form of Western democracy and free market economy. But the fall of the old system certainly didn't mean prosperity in the new. The graffiti on this surviving statue of Marx said it all. Workers of the world, forgive me. Modern Spain was in many senses born in 1975 with the death of General Franco. King Juan Carlos, seen here with Franco before the dictator's death, helped restore democracy to the country, a process that's gone on more successfully and more peacefully than many critics believed possible. Outwardly at least, the new Spain was thriving. The country's membership of the EC and NATO overturned the isolationism of the Franco era. Barcelona had the Olympics and Seville the International Trade Fair, Expo 92. After the elections of 1993, Catalan and Basque separatists achieved more national political power than ever before. But in the Basque country at least, the emphasis had moved away from independence to the realities of restoring an outmoded economy and industries. Many of the poorer regions, like Galicia, suffered badly from recession but still the trend remains to devolve more power away from the capital, Madrid. The beaches of Spain still seem as popular as they were 25 years ago. In that time, though, the whole country has modernized out of all recognition. Nineteen ninety-two marked an important sea change in the social and economic history of modern Sweden. Gone was the world-famous Swedish model forged by 60 years of social democratic government with a strong welfare state and state intervention in industry and the economy. 
in was a conservative free market approach of tax cuts, privatising state industries and an austerity budget to battle the recession. Sweden had also committed itself to membership of the European community and closer defence ties with the West. Pollution has been a problem that has angered the outdoor-loving Swedes, indeed all Scandinavians. Acid rain has poisoned a huge number of the country's lakes and forests. The Swedes say European air pollution should be cut by at least half. Ironically, the murder of Olaf Palma, a peace-loving Prime Minister, pointed to much that's good in the Swedish way of life. Like any ordinary Swede, he was at the movies, completely unguarded. He was shot as he walked home with his wife. No one thought for a moment it could ever happen in Sweden. Switzerland lies at the heart of Europe, but it's still not wholly part of the European community. Most recently, the Swiss voted against membership of the European Economic Area, the free trade bloc for non-members of the EC. The 80s and the 90s have been a shock to the well-off Swiss. Inflation and unemployment have been uncharacteristically high. Homelessness and drug addiction have brought a previously unknown social malaise to the country. The entire banking industry is being completely overhauled and updated in the struggle to keep the international prominence the Swiss once took for granted. To help Switzerland compete with the rest of Europe and the world, its political leaders say the whole economy must be liberalised. The 6.8 million Swiss are deeply attached to their decentralised government and many fear their interests will not be protected inside the European community. The dilemma is whether their lifestyle can survive well enough outside it. For Turkey, April 17, 1993, proved an important turning point, whatever the future had in store. The country mourned the death of President Ozal. He'd done more than any other individual to shape Turkey during the 80s and 90s. During Ozal's period in office, Turkey turned its face firmly to the West. It has the highest growth rate within the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, but it also has very high inflation. And it's set for a customs union with the European community. With an important air base at Insulik, Turkey also took the side of NATO and the West during the Gulf War, which angered many Muslims within the country. Along the old Silk Road to China, the collapse of the Soviet Union left economic opportunity in lands that historically were part of the Turkish world, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan and others. But it has left instability as well, with Islamic fundamentalism growing within Turkey itself and the army, as always, waiting in the wings. The political leaders have a difficult path to tread. For Great Britain, the last quarter of the 20th century was dominated by Margaret Thatcher and the brand of conservatism to which she gave her name. In office, she presented the image of a strong, sometimes Churchillian leader, seeing the country through the boom and bust 1980s. With John Major, a very different leader, inherited a full-blown recession and a country rather gloomy and ill at ease with itself. According to the pollsters, ordinary people lost their pride in Britain and didn't have much confidence in the future. People believed the country was less safe, less well-governed, less kindly and more violent. Nearly half of those polled said they'd emigrate if they could. The recession had a lot to do with it, of course. Unemployment crippled many parts of the country, although in the early 90s, interest rates and inflation did fall dramatically the future of the National Health Service remained one of the key political issues. Opposition leaders accused the government of trying to get rid of the NHS altogether. The government insisted reform was essential for its survival. The other big debate dividing the country was Europe and whether Britain risked losing its sovereignty by giving Brussels and Strasbourg more say in political and economic life. 
nor did people find much solace in the royal family. It was publicly split by troubled marriages. Only a quarter of Britons now believed the monarchy was something to be proud of. The decline of traditional industries hit hard in many parts of the country. And in Scotland and Wales, some people believed that greater political independence would give them better lives. But in the end, they never voted for it. In Northern Ireland, the same old story, an economy dominated by troubles and terrorism. The problem with some national opinion polls is that they encourage nostalgia and they encourage false comparisons with a past golden age that probably never existed. But the end of the 20th century did see Britain searching for a new image of itself and in every sense, a new prosperity. The Vatican City is the smallest state in the world and one of the most powerful. Built around St. Peter's in Rome, it's just over a hundred acres in size with a population of around a thousand. It has an absolute leader in the Pope. And from here he guides the entire Roman Catholic population of the world. Through the Vatican's own diplomatic service, the Pope still makes his influence known in the cabinet rooms of many of the world's governments. Tito remains one of the most remarkable European leaders of the 20th century. He effectively created the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. He was socialist, but independent of Soviet control. Pro-Western, but also one of the founders of the non-aligned movement. After he died, 35 years of stability went with him, and the Yugoslavia he dedicated his life to began to fall apart. In Belgrade, the collective leadership that assumed power after Tito's death was beset by economic troubles, and most of all, ethnic unrest. For much of the 90s, the Yugoslav people had been torn apart by civil war. In particular, the Serbian campaign to create an ethnically pure Greater Serbia has brought intervention from the United Nations and repeated international attempts at a peace formula. All sides have been guilty of atrocities.